together of a magazine, an art exhibit, um, and a sonic landscape, if you will, of, from health and beauty. And all together, it sort of creates this other thing, this aggregation of uh, here on Hollywood Boulevard, where is, if you go out there tonight, you will find all sorts of other aggregations. <laughs> Um, and I'm also thinking in this like the space between reflections and things like in betweens um, that this might also be a mirror of um, a mirroring of the global protest movements that are going on um, and which actually are talked about in the issue um, where dominant media uh, is sort of disrupted. Um, with secondary media, and so we're sort of in a, you know, secondary media platform right now, and um, and the public space, which of which this is a sort of a semi-public space, along a very strange public space, um, Hollywood Boulevard, is um, is a, is a place of protest, and a spot. And I also was reading um, a Verona Pulse piece on Jürgen Meyer's Parasol, which takes a very form-driven object and sort of transforms it into a place of protest. And it made me think that there's a spot that doesn't necessarily follow function, but where the formal sort of allows for aberrant occupations to happen. And then Michael Chen in the issue also discusses Occupy Wall Street as a network of ur uh, an urban network manifestation, sort of a coming together of weak ties. And in a way, this is a coming together of many weak ties which sort of form a strong bonds in the end. Um, maybe only like polymers, kind of like the styrofoam that's holding together our installation tonight. Um, so I'm really excited to have sort of all these weak ties and strong ties and you know, sort of things coming together here at Uho tonight. And I'm hoping that this becomes the beginning of many ties to sort of happen from this event and, and sort of move out sort of into the future. So tonight we have uh, three performances. Uh, we have Iker Gill, who is the editor of Moss Context. He's an architect and urban designer, and he's also the director of Moss Studio. Um, in addition, he teaches at UIC, and he's the recipient of the 2010 Emerging Visions Award from the Chicago Architecture Club. Uh, up after him is the co-editor on the Aberrations issue, John Zott, who's an award-winning designer from New York, Hava, um, <laughs> named Brooklyn House. And um, he runs John Zott Studio, and he is also a founding member of Brooklyn Digital Foundry. And uh, without further ado, because I've sort of had it, had it with the mic, um, I'm going to pass it over to Eager to sort of talk us through the issue. Yeah. Woo! 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 I love the, being able to, to be here, and I, it's actually the first time that we've ever presented an issue of mass context in public, so I think it's, it's a great opportunity to show a little bit what we've done in the, next, in the first three years of the magazine, and uh, I think it's also a really important uh, moment with this issue, which is the first time that we've actually uh, have a guest editor with uh, John. So I think this is, it's, we've been doing this for 12 issues now, and it's the first time for a lot of things, so I think it's a, it's a great thing for us. Uh, to celebrate it here. So I know a lot of you don't know really what the magazine is about or anything. So my role, John is gonna actually going to talk a, lot, uh, talk a little bit about the magazine, uh, about the issue specifically, and then about his his work, because not only he was the guest editor, he actually was one of the uh, contributors. So I think that it's, it's really important, I think, that he talks about that. So I'm just gonna give like 10 clues about what the magazine is about, what we're trying to do with that, and uh, a little bit of what we've done, but also where, where I think this should be going in the next few issues. Um, I think one of the first things is that why are we doing a, a magazine that is this independent magazine? And I think it's 
uh, a little bit is uh, the idea of control. Like, we can control like who, what, where, uh, when, and how. Basically, it's like uh, who we collaborate with, which I think is always fantastic. I mean, you can see some of the uh, contributors that we had here in this issue, but uh, who we collaborate with, what are the topics that we are doing, uh, which is something that we usually uh, relate to the practice that I run, but also other things that are important for the architectural discipline. Uh, where we want to concentrate our effort in the issue, uh, when we want to release uh, the issue, and how we want to do it. So I think it's, there are so many flexible things that we can control and define depending on the topic or other aspects. I think it's really interesting uh, uh, the format it really allows for, the, for this control. So that's one of the other aspects. We actually had a really interesting conversation before about the publishing um, issue. So I think we, we just bypass a lot of the things that are not important in publishing and and we can do many more things. The other thing is uh, the mass context is always based on a specific topic. Uh, we do this quarterly and there's always one specific thing. So uh, they go from, uh, they are usually fairly open, so that way we can really incorporate uh, projects and ideas from many different disciplines. So we don't, uh, in order of, uh, since the beginning, it was more advanced work, which uh, Andreas had his work there. Uh, Woo <laughs> and uh, we had living, we had energy, we had amusement, um, we had information, we had public, uh, network, conflict, speed, and the last is aberration. So uh, they are fairly wide topics, uh, but they are always really uh, interesting uh, contributions. And also, you can see here in the covers, uh, we always invite a guest cover designer that in, in a way sparks the start of the issue, or it's actually it summarizes the rest of the issue. So, but it's always a specific topic that we're doing. Uh, here's a list of the contributors that we have so far. Um, we've had over 140, I think, contributors right now. We usually have about 12 or 13 articles in every issue, but as you can see, it's uh, all over the board, all over the places, and uh, Mimi has been uh, instrumental in. But, quite a few of the, some of the articles, he actually has uh, guest curated some of them, so I think it's, you know, it's really interesting to start these conversations for other things. In the case of Mimi, we actually started through Intelligentsia and a uh, coffee-fueled uh, <laughs> meeting, which is usually what, how things happen, but I think it's, it's really interesting to see how these, how these lists of collaborators in many aspects, like, keeps evolving and we keep adding different, different people. Uh, as you can see, I mean, some of the people we try to get some of them that are fairly established people, uh, but we also try to give uh, a voice to a lot of people who are more emerging architects or other people that are, are fairly, they're doing great things, but they might not have a formal publishing um, or any other as a way of, of talking about certain things. And this ties really well with this. I mean, the idea of, we're trying to give a voice to uh, ideas or topics that they might not get out there. And I, I wanted to use this picture because I think this was a pretty interesting moment without uh, we did a, we ran a story about mid-century buildings in New Orleans. Uh, they, these are all public schools. Uh, they are incredible buildings that they they actually uh, won a lot of awards when they were built, and they are actually all getting torn down now. So uh, we ran a story. Uh, there was an article written by uh, Francine Stock, who's the who runs the uh, Doc Momo from New Orleans, and she was trying to save the buildings, and nobody was basically listening to her. And, we ran the story and then they use the uh, mass context in the hearing in front of the city hall to try to uh, build an argument to save the buildings. Uh, we were not lucky to save this building, which was a very good building, but um, we began to see that it's not only just like a few architects that are having fun writing things for themselves, but it, was, it, it could be a tool for people who do not, they're not able to explain this uh, or for whatever reason, within their cities, they can't really be heard. Uh, it has happened also with another one that we did recently that was about the transformation of Madrid. That uh, It's a whole comprehensive story about how the city has to transform and the city hall doesn't want to hear about it. They don't get press, so they're using press from outside Madrid to actually begin to engage the conversation. So it's, it's an interesting thing that whether we know or not, it always happens. Um, the other aspect that we really like to work is that uh, the idea of having multidisciplinary approach to the project, to the topic. So most of these, or all of the uh, issues actually have all the people that are there. They might be architects, they might be uh, urban designers, we have illustrators, uh, filmmakers, musicians. So it's really interesting how you approach the same topic from different 
perspectives, and even in the case of this image, which is by Luis Burbulo, who's the architect who did the cover, he actually himself, he works in the video format, he works in, uh, he actually designs buildings, he, does, he illustrates, so he's working in many platforms, which is really interesting. So I think we always want to bridge that and make people uh, do articles like photographers with essays or illustrators to, to work together and one influence the other. So that, that was something that was important from the beginning that uh, in my case I'm really interested in photography and graphic design and that had always to be something that was present in the, in the magazine. Um, the other thing of the format that I think we, we struggled at the beginning because we really like, I really like the, the physical, um, it's, you can see here one of the other ones, uh, I like the physical format of a magazine, it's fantastic, but it also has a certain uh, cost associated with it, but also like the way it can reach to other people. So uh, we, we allow for people to print the magazine, which I think it's, uh, it's how we intended it to be, but we also make it available online as a PDF, and what has been critical about that is that it has given us a global reach, but also a pro. So not only we serve it with more people, but we get more people to write in it. So I think, just like this morning, I mean, during this, just this year, uh, I think there were 144 countries who have access mass context. So it's a, we don't do this in a way to just say, well, look at how many people we've reached, but also like how many people we can get feedback and contribute. So I think it's a, it's a really interesting. I mean, you can see that most of it, uh, I think we have a list here, I think by order, it's the US, Spain, UK, Brazil, Italy, Canada, Australia, Germany, France, and Mexico. Those are the 10 top countries that I have. So I think it's a, you know, the, the physical copies are great. It's a, it's a fantastic way of sharing the information, of seeing the, the content, but it's also the online version, the PDFs. It, it all helps uh, Twitter, any other format. It really helps to, uh, to share these ideas. Uh, another thing that we have introduced this year is actually a series of curation uh, uh, curatorial projects that go beyond the editors of the magazine and there are two ways that we have done that one is looking back at all the content that has been produced and for example BB uh, was the first one that started this segment but people who look at the content that has been produced and then they they create another topic that relates they relate these articles that were happening across the first three years so that was one of the segments. I was looking back at what has been produced. And then with John, we really started the other version, which is saying we're going to collaborate with other people that helps us move uh, into new issues, new topics. So I think it's a really interesting to see it's like how you can reframe all the conversation that has been already generated, but at the same time begin to create other new ones. So, uh, and I think in this case, I mean, with John, was, was, it was fantastic to be able to push the, the magazine really into an issue that. Uh, it was fascinating, but maybe we, we probably wouldn't have even uh, had the guts to uh, address. Uh, so that was that was really good. So, and this is also I think there's been a lot of changes in the in this last year, which are all for for good. And and I think this is another one that we see the magazine as a as a platform to share really great ideas and content, but it's a starting point to do other things. So. Uh, we started to do this event that we are hoping to do a yearly event about this, uh, which was a whole day of presentations by, uh, as you can read there, emerging and established practitioners within the field of design. And there were 16 presenters with John was there, and there were graphic designers, there were photographers, there were architects. They all did presentations around certain topics. It was communication, collaboration, uh, documentation, and speculation. So again, there was like based on themes that everybody was presenting and they were cross-referencing disciplines. Uh, there was a bookstore, the design bookstore in, uh, in the same space and then there were two exhibitions there. So uh, we really wanted to take the same ideas of collaboration and how do you team with disciplines and topics and take it something physical in Chicago that can start that conversation. So the virtual and the, the real really related. And in the end, what we are basically doing this is all to just spark that discussion about design, the possibilities, and these are just some images about that event. Uh, and it was a 12-hour event. I mean, it was just uh, there was a lot of things going on, and uh, but I think we ended up like there was a hundred people in the end. Still, I mean, it's, it was really interesting uh, event. So what we try to do is like through the events, through the magazine. Uh, generate discussions and then they, they take their own life and then they get 
come back to us and we get some feedback and then we keep going with this. So um, I think uh, having an event like here with John and I, I think this is going to take the, uh, the next issue to another another situation. So anyway, that's a little bit of like mass context in 10 points. Um, I hope now you everybody just downloads and all those things. But uh, so I'm going to pass the mic to John who's actually going to talk about the, this collaboration that uh, started about six months ago. Uh, it was uh, long. It was when there was sun in Chicago and it was warm. Uh, but and, uh, and I think it's been, a, as I said, it's been a fantastic uh, relationship. I think it's. It, I, I'm a big fan of John's work, and uh, I thought it was fantastic to bring his take. And, uh, so he's going to show a little bit what he did with the issue and uh, his work. Yeah, she got thirsty. Can we get the lights? Please, I'm just starting flipping light switches over there. We can switch. Yeah. Wait, you know, wait, I can try. See what happens if we do that. Worst could happen, right? West Hollywood starts seeping in here. And we'll just take a couple of pills and let it, let it happen. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? All right. Did I have to say what well, that's not Thank you. I've tried, John. Really? All right, I got my job. So what we really want to do is we want to get these lights yeah, here. I don't think no. Well done. I brought kind of an academic presentation tonight. This feels a little bit more like a bar mitzvah. Uh, so I don't know. I don't think this is going to work out very well. We're going to try and keep this casual and personable as possible. Uh, I, uh, I do a little teaching on the side, a few of seminar courses, so I don't mind being interrupted. If at any point somebody wants to kind of enter into a dialogue or something, I'd be fine. Oh, uh, that's exactly what we're looking for. Romantic. Right. Uh, so, you know, thanks to Eager, thanks to Mimi, uh, thanks Woodbury for uh, hosting us this evening. Uh, it was sad to see Mimi leave the uh, East Coast, but it looks like she's set up very nicely here on the West Coast. I, uh, after one day here in beautiful weather, I can see why she made the movie. Um, and of course, I, you know, the collaboration with Eager over the last, the guy didn't realize it was six months, but it's been a long time, um, has been really amazing. Uh, Eager is probably one of the most motivated people I've ever worked with. And uh, to see him make this happen was kind of an amazing thing in and of itself. So, that's the opportunity, it was really terrific. Um, uh, the issue, well, as Eager mentioned, I uh, was going to talk a little bit about what we were trying to accomplish with this particular issue. Uh, it, uh, it was organized by uh, Eager and myself after a series of emails and phone conversations. We spent trying to pin down a rather slippery idea, which at its heart is a kind of paradox. We wanted to collect ideas that were coming from outside an orthodox architectural practice. Or, well, design practice, really, just because of the multidisciplinary nature of this endeavor, uh, to enrich the proposals which they were dealing with. And that in and of itself is a rather diffuse proposal. Um, in a way, what I just described is, is a kind of natural process of innovation. Um, ideas that are unorthodox coming and infusing and enriching the process in which they were uh, uh, tangentially a part of. But innovation implies a kind of quantifiable progress along the performative vector. And this is not really what we were interested in. We were, we were in pursuit of something that operates on the oblique, the kinds of responsibilities and standards of achievement that a designer or an artist typically assumes and aspires to. Uh, now, what we saw were, were not innovative ideas, but rather pathological ones. And this is a kind of general way of talking about it. And it simplifies the rather complex problem, so it doesn't capture all of the nuance of some of the things that we were talking about wanted to uh, accomplish. But it is a convenient way of describing it. Uh, these were ideas that had the capacity to, to compromise uh, a building or a project, uh, to dismantle the conventions that define what the building is supposed to do, or what a meaningful experience is supposed to be comprised of. And this call in and of itself is rather vague because it's built on another supposition, which is, and here I'm going to get a little more explicitly architectural, uh, what exactly is a building supposed to do? <laughs> or be, for that matter, which is a fun question in architecture schools that gets bounced around quite a bit, and nobody seems to have a really good answer. 
Uh, it's funny, I think you probably find better answers within the kind of uh, uh, the non-technical crowd, that is those who don't have a formal background in architecture. Uh, but those of us that work very closely with them are always a little bit confounded by this question. And of course these questions became opportunities for the issue. Uh, you know, in the pieces that we collected, uh, we saw definitions for buildings emerge from, from a kind of uh, the dialectical arguments that they presented. I'm telling some of the things that the building isn't, but what it might be. Now, in all fairness, like these ideas emerged after the fact. We had to start the issue somewhere. So we chose practicality as the overarching convention. And ideas that challenged practicality in pursuit of an unorthodox experience became our object. So I guess the question is, why in the hell would we want to do this? Um, because of some of the uh, possibilities that it might evoke. Well, we felt that in its current state, uh, architecture, uh, which is ostensibly you know, one, of the, one of the primary focuses of the journal, uh, serves as a rather limited audience. Or more accurately, architecture's ability to serve a specific audience is somewhat limited. And although the range of clients that architects serve, uh, that serves varies widely on several different dimensions, architectural support is too encumbered by societal obligations to embrace Many of the methods of provocation that have led great, they have, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get it. The societal obligations the architect has to deal with has prevented architecture from embracing many of the, of the methods of provocation that have led to great cultural insight in other art forms. So, what kind of future are we talking about then for architecture if we're, if we're trying to close this gap? And, there are a few enticing dynamics that we might start to tease out. So this is where we start to talk a little bit about some of the work that my studio has been doing uh, as, a, as part of the foundation for where the, uh, the issue is going, but also as an introduction to my, my personal contribution to the issue. Uh, and these have been slides here, some of the um, uh, title uh, pages from some of the issues, that, that some of the concept you'd find in the current issue, which have been, uh, uh, there's a really amazing bouquet of totally ridiculous and exciting ideas for what a building might be, or what a, what a design practice might embrace, you know, in and out of architecture, kind of swerving and touching on many different things. So, what is it that, what, what is it that we might accomplish through closing this gap? Well, uh, there are a couple of points that, we, a couple of things that might come of this endeavor. Uh, first, it might be about transcendence. Okay, this is Gordon Latta Clark's splitting from 1974. Uh, and uh, uh, some of you might know his work uh, as a seminal, uh, I'm sorry, you know, an important artist for uh, you know, some of the kind of institute type work that emerged from that period of art history. Uh, here, moments of violence or duress or destruction can bring change, and in some cases, greater understanding. So when, when Matter Clark cuts a building, or more accurately, he shows us the, the photos that he snapped of a building that he had cut. The figural presence of the slice transforms the reading of the building. It's no longer possible to see an assemblage of construction materials. It's been reduced to two like hunks of house. And ironically, this act of destruction has answered the difficult question, what is a building, by virtue of the clarity of the gesture. So now it stands before us as a profound ruin. And this is an example of how pathological activity elucidates the concept of building. It, 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 if you will, it intensifies a building's building mess. Uh, it could be about presence. Uh, there are many instances of pathological activity that present overpowering ideas that are captivating in their grotesqueness. Or like in this case, their obsessive relentlessness. Uh, ideas like these attract us from outside of conventional definitions of beautiful because you know, they're poetic and they're resonant, but often repugnantly so. But no matter how they're characterized, they're undeniable in the way that they command our attention and inspire contemplation. Uh, it's a little bit about specificity. Uh, this is something that almost anything manufactured exhibits after some use, and in the case of buildings, specificity uh, you know, it goes beyond material effects to come with exposure to the environment or users, legitimate or otherwise. Uh, the kind of specificity that they exhibit also organizes context. Uh, 
and the way that we orient ourselves. The way we navigate urban landscapes can be facilitated through this process, and its effects serve to bond the buildings with their history and context. Uh, this is a process that's automatic and unpredictable, and uh, that's, those are two aspects that make this, uh, this phenomenon all the more valuable. And then there's the question of eccentricity. Uh, now this is related to specificity, it's brought on by environmental forces like vandalism and dilapidation, but eccentricity comes from modifications that happen through patterns of legitimate use. So it usually brings a casual sensibility to bear on the places we encounter, and it almost always tells us a very intimate story. So, you know, back at the studio, like, this is a lot to deal with. And, to open up this can of worms every time we want to talk about these things is obviously a little bit inconvenient. We had to find a shorthand for talking about it. And one of the ways we describe it is uh, uh, some, we, we call these things archipathological. Uh, and we consider the topic in general as something artificial pathology. I know, I know, I know. But <laughs> actually, these kind of large words, it's a little easier to kind of like uh, uh, throw these around than it is to kind of carry all the legacy or the, the, the baggage of the ideas that I described a moment ago. Um, now, there are two interesting aspects to, to the subject. I mean, first, uh, archipathological phenomena exist outside the bounds of an architectural practice. What you have to understand is that these things are defined through the conflict uh, with what I'll call arch the architectural ambitions of the building. That's to say that the intended purpose behind their product, conscious coordination of these things, will destroy them, or at least compromise what they are, uh, some fundamental uh, aspect of their being. And the second is that they can be defined as uh, pernicious at some level, but uh, be that level simply aesthetic or because they're impractical. Despite those things, they are not experientially bankrupt. And that's their core attraction for us, is that you know, when you consider these two points together, you have a range of design ideas that represent a unique cultural perspective but it's without representation in the field of architecture. And that's what we want to do is we want to, we want to bring that last kind of blind spot or eliminate it within the things that we do as far as building design is concerned. Now, it's important to recognize this isn't exactly a new idea. All the other creative disciplines have been doing this for a long time. They've embraced pathological themes with great success. And architecture has it for obvious reasons, and it holds itself accountable to society. So we can't afford to adopt practices that might compromise the values that are held in the majority. So okay. So let's talk about buildings. Um, what I'm going to do here is uh, uh, describe this uh, process uh, that we started about 18 months ago, um, where we started to develop three projects that are meant to elucidate the, uh, the ideas within the rhetoric that I just presented. Uh, I'm going to focus mainly on the second chapter of this like three chapter series, uh, but I'm going to do the, the introduction to that chapter by way of the first chapter that we completed earlier this year, and that was a project for uh, the Soho neighborhood of New York City that addresses uh, pathological phenomena, uh, or the pathological phenomenon of vandalism in the form of graffiti. Uh, this project was a, uh, is intended to be a concrete shell that's uh, modeled after the Soho manufacturing typology, which you kind of see here. Uh, it's uh, not a terribly remarkable uh, arrangement for a building. It's fairly practical in uh, many respects. Uh, and in this case, we rendered the, the form of the building in concrete to serve as a backdrop for the activity of uh, New York City's ambitious street riders. Uh, they would be implicitly invited to come and vandalize the building, which would then be, and their work would then become permanent features on the, both the interior and the exterior of the building. Uh, now, despite the fact that the shell of the building is kind of conventional, um, here this series of uh, short clips shows some of, the, some of the details that are remarkable about this building in this case. Uh, you'll notice on the left-hand side there are little nodules there in the stairwell uh, opening that would become uh, footholds or handholds for uh, you know, maybe some more of the, uh, the more ambitious portions of this crew to kind of uh, get an opportunity to work on some of the, uh, the less accessible parts of the building. Uh, there are places where sun shading has become uh, a ledge for access to the exterior of the building, as you can see here in the middle section. And then there are also like tiny lips and other little kind of crevices that could become platforms for, I'm sorry, supports for improvised platforms to give uh, uh, these same uh, 
uh, riders access to other portions of the building which would make great canvases. Now, the important thing to keep in mind here is that uh, these, 